Hello, everyone. I'm John Coleman, and this is Christian History and Ideas Season 2. We're going to be looking at post-bourgeois Christianity. Before we get into this exciting topic in this rebooted series, I want to bring your attention and mine to Apocalyptus Institute. We are an in-person and online college here in and on New Milford, Connecticut, USA. And especially appropriate for this series, and indeed inspired by this series several years ago, is our class. So if you go to our About the School section and click on our School of Theology, you will see that we run a special course on just this very idea, Christian history and ideas, where we look at week to week various diverse topics related to the Christian walk and the Christian community in this world, both historically and presently, and indeed, as we'll find out, looking into the future. We've covered, as you know, on this public series, topics as diverse as the rise of the pilgrimage movement in the 4th century, the church in China. We have looked at elements with Eastern Christianities, art, and indeed today we're going to kind of take a sociological look. But if you want to get deeper and study with our scholars, in particular this course is taught by Professor David Rios, if you would like to do this one-on-one -on -one and in a small group setting live, this class is for you. It runs typically through a 16-week college semester, which is a regular semester, but we also have options for less of a time commitment and even an intensive course of four sessions for very powerful and power-packed sessions. So please consider that. Please consider Apocalyptus in all of its offerings, both in our uh, school of Theology, Arts, and then additionally our School of Sciences. We have Mathematics and Natural Science courses as well. And you can find all of that down below at apocalyptastasisinstitute.wordpress.com. Okay, with that, let's get into our topic here. We're looking at post-bourgeois Christianity, in particular the look at Johann Baptist Metz and his insights into this. You're invited as we embark on this latest topic and this latest season of Christian history and ideas to write us at just that, christianhistoryandideas at gmail.com. You can find that down below in addition to the school access information. But I came across this topic, you know, in one of the courses lately, I've been looking at the Reformation and early modern Europe, and at that time, this was something that the Reformers themselves were quite uh, interested in. What does Reformation mean? And did the singular Reformation of the 16th century go far enough? as they would argue it. And of course, we know historically that at least certain uh, people of that time and place argued no. And that's how you ended up with uh, what's sometimes called the Magisterial Reformation. Uh, your Lutherans, your Calvinists, your Zwinglians, uh, your Anglicans, these uh, church structures, clerical structures, teaching structures, that making appeals, in fact, uh, to church councils and fathers, contrasted with the Anabaptist, as they were called back then, kind of a catch-all phrase of uh, basically people taking the sola scriptura uh, premise to its logical conclusion. We might call them evangelicals today. These terms are somewhat somewhat um, slippery. But in any case, uh, what, what modern scholarship calls the Radical Reformation. That's how you end up with this uh, dynamic um, when you're, you're asking, you know, has the Reformation, have our principles that we've set out upon uh, come to their ultimate conclusion? 
So anyway, I've been bathing in that uh, mentally and cogitating on the Reformation, on the wars of religion, on uh, the Treaty of Westphalia, and this very, very exciting time in uh, certainly Western European history and indeed world history as well. One of the things that I came across was this article by Johann Baptist Metz towards the second Reformation, the future of Christianity in a post-bourgeois world. And uh, this led me to find out about Metz, and we're going to get into him a little bit more. Now, there was a movement formerly called uh, we'll say the movement for the Second Reformation in the 19th century in the Church of Ireland, that is to say the Anglican Church in Ireland. We're not talking about that uh, today, and that's an interesting topic. Maybe we'll have a whole show on that uh, another time. But uh, let's look at that subtitle. You can't have an academic uh, essay without a subtitle, can you? So the future of Christianity in a post-bourgeois world. And right now, as I'm looking at this, I'm, I'm seeing bing, 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 bing with my Reformation studies. And that's uh, piqued my interest because I'm looking at a Roman Catholic author and cleric, Johann Baptist Metz. We're going to find out about him. Uh, and we're looking at uh, this, this topic. Of course, when we look at the Reformation historically, we realize that we're not just talking about the, the beginning of the uh, Protestant movement, let's say, but also, in a sense, the beginning of Catholicism as well, as we understand it now. Though That's bold to say that. But we do have to understand that Western Christianity looks very different, whether it's Catholic or Protestant, it looks very different than what it looked like before. And one of the, the, uh, the touchstone topics, maybe the touchstone, in fact, when it comes to the 16th century religious developments is this concept of the bourgeoisie. You don't have a Reformation, Catholic or Protestant, without the bourgeoisie. And it's a fascinating topic that we'll have plenty of time to get into. But this is the, the bourgeoisie, not the post-bourgeois. But the bourgeoisie is a, a social class that historically is a very squirrely group of people. And even if you go into the ancient world, this sort of class has always been known uh, to be squirrely because it allies itself uh, between both the lower classes and the upper classes. And it shifts its allegiance as uh, needs be, as any class will. Uh, there's similar confederations between the upper class and, and the peasantry uh, throughout history as well. But the bourgeois in the context of the 16th century Reformation are uh, very fascinating because they've been growing. They've been growing uh, really since the 13th century, the merchant class, the class of uh, finance. And this particular show is not actually about the historical Reformation, the first Reformation, if you like. But it is worth pointing out, as Metz is going to be laying things out, and we get to know him a little bit. It is important to know that you do not have a Reformation without the bourgeoisie. You do not have that. The Protestant movement uh, in its time was um, completely a bourgeois movement. Wherever it got traction was amongst that class. And it got traction in those areas of Europe, both Western and Central, which had such a class. And actually was very... Uh, apathetically received in those areas where the bourgeois was not so predominant. And that's a whole topic of itself. Again, if you write us at christianhistoryandideas at gmail.com, uh, that's going to be the best way to remind me, hey, John, you got to get in on this topic. Uh, don't forget it. I want to see this topic covered. Maybe you want to be on this show. You have a special interest maybe in in uh, African church architecture or something please you're welcome uh, to to do that get in touch please okay so uh Johann Baptist Metz I just want to show you a image of your man so here he is looking very 1960s and very scholarly uh, indeed 
So here's your man. And he died not too long ago, Lord of mercy on him. He died not too long ago from this late, 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 late 2022 recording. All right, so let's read some opening words here and then progress. This is from JSTOR, which is a great uh, journal archive. And actually, a good lot of their material, though I'm afraid not this particular text, is available for free for anyone who makes a simple account with them. Uh, I think you get 100 free articles a month, and then you got to shell out the shekels. So Metz has a post-post script, I suppose, uh, from the first to the second Reformation. And he says, to speak about the Reformation and make it not just an object of remembrance, but an object of hope, indeed an incentive to change, change for all of us, including myself as a Catholic, means one thing. It was bring that question and that awareness which inspired the Reformation into our relationship with the present age. Now, just so we... we um, bound this topic of reformation properly i do want to reiterate this idea of the reformation is a reality that equally changes what becomes protestantism and equally changes uh, what becomes catholicism uh in the typical dialogue maybe something that we're taking away from our our public school grade school memory you know it's the protestants they are they are experiencing the reformation and then the catholics are carrying on this is not really uh, respecting the historical reality so both of which are are transformed by this period uh, uh thoroughly into into what we understand these communities as today and of course we recall that uh, for a good hundred years at least, at least uh, prior to the Reformation and, and in certain ways even longer, you have these strains. And so we don't want to see so much as a division of Christianity at the Reformation, but a transformation into these two distinct um, experiences because both tendencies predate, predate um, the 16th century. In a sense, medieval Catholicism is this synthesis, or what I sometimes call Mediterranean Christianity, is this synthesis of the Hebraic mythology of the Holy Bible being the skeleton of Mediterranean Christianity, which becomes medieval Christianity. That's the skeleton, this Hebraic setup, this Hebraic theology, which is itself fleshed out with Hellenic thought and Hellenic uh, experience and Hellenic eyes. And what happens at the Reformation is that that Hebraic strain becomes predominant. It becomes explicitly predominant in the Protestant communions, and it becomes de facto predominant until the Second Vatican Council, from the time of Trent to the Second Vatican Council in the Catholic communities. And I don't want to um, belabor that point too, too much, but it is uh, necessary to understand uh, this aspect of how this transformation in the 16th century takes place and what exactly is taking place. It's this type of Judaic uh, reassertion. Okay, uh, so our man continues here. In this regard, I want to propose to you a thesis about the future of Christianity in a post-bourgeois society. And I am aware that this thesis is highly controversial and is certain to be challenged. Yet no risk, yet to risk what is controversial and to become thereby precisely a theologian open to attack remains, in my view, not the least significant part of the moral heritage of the Reformation. This thesis is as follows. The Reformation was situated within the disappearance of the medieval feudal world and the emergence of the so-called bourgeoisie. At the first uh, early bourgeois world, and that's what defines modernity, 
uh, it is my uh, assertion and and belief uh, that there is such a thing as uh, the pre-modern world, the modern world, and you'll often hear me use the expressions postmodern and supermodern. And it's sufficient now uh, to understand that I do make those assertions, but also, uh, especially for here, what is one of the characteristics of modernity? It is the bourgeois. What is the bourgeois? It is the middle class mercantile class. So this is coming into its own. Now, uh, a few words of insight are necessary here to, to grasp the dynamics that we're seeing in modernity. If modernity is bourgeois, what are we talking about? What are the specific things that are identifiable with modernity uh, and, and with the bourgeois that bound it? What makes it different than the medieval social structure and of the postmodern and supermodern structures? Okay, uh, you, you might want to write these down. Hi everyone, John Coleman quickly here in the middle of this presentation to invite you to go over to apocalypsestasisinstitute.wordpress.com and while there in the drop down of about the school, you can find out all about just that, the classes we offer, information about enrollment and matriculation, our schools of theology, arts and sciences, as well as our campus and staff and testimonials in addition to related materials. We accept students of about 16 years of age and up and teach at the undergraduate level. And with that, back to the show. Uh, the bourgeois is predicated indeed on financial interest. Often, especially as things develop, he will not own his capital. This is not so uh, observable in the 16th, 17th or 18th centuries. But more and more, the people are living off the land and I mean that in the sense of they're not on the land. They're living in cities. In fact, that's the root, the bourg, that's the root of the word bourgeois. Uh, it's the, the people of the city. So the bourgeois is one who makes his living uh, off of uh, commerce. He's not like the feudal serf uh, plowing the land so much. Um, also, uh, with huge psychological ramifications, the bourgeois success in the bourge is predicated on how other citizens uh, appraise him, right? In, in, in a crude way, right? You have a job and you're not sleeping on the street because your boss is not pissed off with you, right? Your entire social standing is based off of how much you're able to please those around you. Uh, the reputation is a big thing for the bourgeoisie. Family name is a big thing for the bourgeoisie, right? How others perceive you is a, a major point. Okay, additionally, uh, the individual, entrepreneurialism, not just in business, but that whole psychology is important. Um, rationality, uh, reasoning, these are all important because, you know, Initially, you need these things for business, but you start applying them to the other aspects of life. By this point, you should be understanding why the Protestant Reformation in particular was appealing to the middle class. Some of the points I, la I laid out there, right? Entrepreneurialism, taking the bulls by the horn. Uh, and so forth, right? These are, are very necessary for the Protestant movement to get going. And insofar as Catholicism itself is a product of the Reformation, you can see these groups like the Jesuits and so forth, right? Going out in, in uh, tremendous energies of missionary activity and uh, reclamation projects like in Poland and so forth. So these are the elements. Um, also, finally, uh, alluded to briefly, the concept of rationality right? If you have a copy of the Holy Bible and you can interpret it with the aid of the Holy Spirit, right? There's some assumption of rationality and individuality as well, right? There's Luther at the Diet of Worms. Here I stand, I can do no other, unless I am convinced by reason. All of these things, of course, will be uh, vital for the, the coming liberal revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries. So all of these things undergird the concept of the bourgeoisie. Okay, now 
uh, Metz here is going to argue, and he's writing this in the 1980s, and even the things he's saying by then have been chewed over by, by several decades before him. But whilst uh, the world moves apace, the, by the late 20th, definitely into the 21st century, Metz is understanding that the principles which predicated modernity have changed. Those things I just laid out, a, a, a strong middle class, the understanding of man's rationality, um, entrepreneurialism, being in the city, these things have, have completely changed, and yet the social structures remain. And this leads, as of the time of this recording, to a tremendous tinderbox of social organization, actually very similar to the 16th century. And that's why this topic of a second reformation is especially pertinent. Even Catholicism, Metz goes on, is affected, at least inherently, uh, by this Reformation. In the end, the so-called Counter-Reformation was itself determined by that against which it struggled. And even it assimilated at least partially those problems and contradictions brought by the bourgeoisie into Christianity and rooted in the fact that by degrees the bourgeois citizen had become the real Christian subject. If we use the term bourgeois and the bourgeoisie in a purely historical way, then we are now situated, unless all appearances deceive, at the historical endpoint and turning point of this bourgeois world. Christianity now stands within the disappearance of this bourgeois world. Right? Fascinating. So, just like the church had made a certain uh, rapprochement, and indeed a working alliance with the ruling class of the late classical and medieval worlds. The same church as it exists in history made a certain uh, tacit agreement with the middle class, because that is the dominant uh, ruling class, uh, oddly enough, uh, during uh, modernity. Right, We speak of modernity as being the age of mass man, mass middle class man. Well, that class is going bye-bye, just like the bloodline nobility, at least in terms of superficial organization of the world. We can get into the weeds of, of continuing power structures, but that's for another, another series and probably another channel, shall we say. But... Uh, how is this church, which is to exist until the end of time, how is this church to pivot, to pivot? And by the way, neither uh, advocating nor decrying it, but simply trying to shed light on these dynamics. When you see something like the World Council of Churches, or even the existence of the World Council of Churches, or something like uh, Pope Francis and the Vatican, or a patriarch Bartholomew and some of these feelers that are made and sent out to what might be called globalist sorts. You have to keep this in mind that the uh, gentlemen running those organizations, running the church, let's say, have a consciousness of history. And once you understand that the, that whatever tenuous favor, and that is a very tenuous favor, that the church has uh, benefited from in modernity. However, let's put it this way, however it's been able to keep its head afloat in terms of social heft. Can we say that? Uh, because the relationship of the church to the bourgeoisie was a far pissier and less um, copacetic relationship than it had been in the medieval age. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. Fundamentally, I will argue, because there's a fundamental contradiction in terms of the gospel and the bourgeois mind. But uh, that that's for the future. What's for the present, however, is that be careful about just rolling your eyes 
when you see uh, different uh, bishops and, and such going to the United Nations or going to Davos or having advisors from the WEF and so forth. Uh, we can keep your powder dry, whether you think that's good or bad or whether I do, but do keep in mind the dynamics of history and that the sorts that are represented in the groups just mentioned are uh, naturally speaking, going to be the ruling class that will displace the bourgeois nation state. And keep that in mind, that dynamic. How does the church pivot from one power structure, which is declining, to the next in order to uh, reach as many people as possible with the gospel? It is a very interesting dynamic and one that isn't talked about too much. And I hope in this series that we bring up elements of things that, that indeed are not really being discussed. Okay, so there's that. Here's Metz himself. This article we're going to uh, jump into and just uh, really just acquaint ourselves with. We're going to carry on with this article in our next show. I'm still getting my hands around the scheduling. I'm absolutely committed to doing one show a month here. However, I might be able to do two a month. So just keep an eye on the various podcast platforms that this is appearing on. And again, I do invite the viewers to join us if you would like to be a guest on this show on any topic related to the can of Christian history and ideas. So this is from Common Wheel. This was started by uh, Murin, I forget his first name, and Dorothy Day. And great little um, look at, at uh, Catholic social teaching and so forth. The article is by Frederick Christian Bau Schmidt. Remembering Johann Baptist Mest, and, and this is titled, that's the subtitle, uh, Against Bourgeois Religion. Okay, he's still puffing on the pipe. All right. The German theologian Johann Baptist Metz died on December 2nd, the year being 2019. Okay, so there you go. At the age of 91, he was born in Bavaria, served briefly as a 16-year-old in the Wehrmacht during the closing days of World War II, and basically everyone served in the Wehrmacht in those days, and spent several months in a POW camp in the eastern United States. He studied theology at Bamberg, Munich, Innsbruck, and was ordained a priest in 1954, and was in Innsbruck that he became a student and collaborator of Karl Rahner. After a completion of his studies, which included the doctoral dissertation on Thomas Aquinas, and a few years in pastoral ministry, Metz took up academic position at the University of Munster, speaking of the Reformation and the Anabaptists, in 1963, a very fortuitous year in church history, where he remained for the next 30 years until his retirement. So notice he's in pastoral ministry. What's the number one thing a pastor must know in terms of... Um, Job competence, know your audience. You're speaking to people, you have to know your audience. If you're a scholar, a pastoral scholar, you need to know society. You need to get tight with your sociology. Metz was one of the founders of the journal Concilium, which is often associated with the liberal progressive writings of the post-conciliar church. But he was not so easily pigeonholed Let's see, it was Concilium and the other journal, which kind of centered around Cardinal Ratzinger. Let's see, um, Concilium, let's see, um, Ratzinger, who, then there's another old guy who's still at it. Ratzinger, Con, S-I-L-I-U-M. Yeah, I think Ratzinger's journal was Communi, yeah, commune, Communio. Yes, so that I think was a conservative split from Concilium, but you have to be careful uh, using uh, using you know French Revolution designations. But it was a I don't know what a more traditional approach, but still within the reformist strain. Howsoever, Metz was deeply sympathetic to liberation theology and a politically engaged Christianity. 
Critical of the excessive centralization in the church he saw under Pope St. John Paul II and rejected any backward glancing vision that longs for a pre-Reformation Western Christianity, unquote. At the same time, Metz was not afraid to criticize other theologians who were identified as progressives, whether this was Rahner's theory of quote-unquote anonymous Christianity or the Reformed theology of Jürgen Moltmann's notion of divine suffering. At the end of the day, Metz was more interested in theological arguments than theological parties. When then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who as Archbishop of Munich had blocked Metz's appointment to the university there in 1979, was invited to an academic symposium that was to mark Metz's 70th birthday, 7-0. Hans Kung issued a public broadside denouncing Metz for having sold out to the ecclesiastical powers that be by agreeing to share the stage with the Grand Inquisitor, Ratzinger. Metz is reported to have uh, commented tartly, quote, sometimes Kung conducts himself like a second magisterium. And to tell you the truth, one is enough, at least for me, unquote. So uh, the final words I would have on this episode of Christian History and Ideas, second season, is the communion of Metz and Kong and Ratzinger, the Catholic Church, at the time of the Second Vatican Council, was trying to recognize and, and uh, provide for, or provide against, shall we say, uh, some of the, the drift of the Roman Church, and some of the unusual kind of frozen nature of Western Christianity since the Reformation. Uh, the Council Fathers of Trent had their reasons for kind of freezing Catholicism. But by the 20th century, the Protestant crises, as they would have uh, termed it, had run its course. Protestantism was no longer a, a threat to Catholicism in the way it was in the 16th century. And so um, the organic development of Christian theology, liturgy, and, and all that's related to that could be uh, restarted. And that's really what, what the Second Vatican Council is. That is a topic quite massive itself, but putting Metz and putting this concept as we're building of the emergent church, uh, which is a concept which ultimately will receive actually quite a, a warm reception in certain Protestant circles by the late 20th century, putting all of that in context, you can understand why Metz would be thinking about a second reformation, thinking about social dynamics, the end of the bourgeoisie, where to in the future. If you're in a church, like his Catholic church, that is moving itself beyond the reformation and the, the crisis mode that had been in for 400 years since the Council of Trent, you're naturally going to be seeing parallels between the 16th century and the 20th century, 21st century. And this is the reality of an incarnational faith, of a faith that, that becomes flesh and lives in time. Well, speaking about time, it looks like we're up for this installment of Christian History and Ideas. Please check out both the Pacus de Stasis Institute especially if you're considering taking the private courses that we offer, including Christian History and Ideas. And also please write us at christianhistoryandideas at gmail.com with your show suggestions, your encouragement, your support. Don't forget to follow us on whatever platforms you are hearing this on so you can get notifications. And with that, thank you for your attention, and I'll see you next time. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that presentation brought to you by Apocus to Stasis Institute. If you would like to assist our work, you may do so by going to Apocus to Stasis Institute com slash contact, and you can access our donations website, RhetoricaNova.xyz. You can find that down below in the description. See you next time.